Hey everybody, I'm Natasha Kierczek and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program One on One with Alan Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, a chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He is a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Today we have a special edition of the show where we recapture the finest moments in commentary, bringing you the best of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. Well, you know, Israel's arguing against all of these UN resolutions, claiming that they could cause further violence in Israel. But ever since President Trump's announcement, Israel has seen an uptick in rocket attacks and violence. In fact, Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman even said that Israel is willing to deal with the violence uh, for Trump's recognition. Now, we've just seen reports claiming that Hamas is actually punishing Salafist jihadis who are behind the attacks, leading us to believe that Hamas wants to avoid war given the ongoing Palestinian unity talks. How exactly is any of this going to change the security situation for Israel? Well, you know, unfortunately, the Palestinians never really needed an excuse to attack Israel. If you look at what happened at the aftermath of the unilateral disengagement from Gaza, uh, there was no reason, apparent reason, for them to attack other than their basic hatred and their lack of uh, ability to recognize our very right to exist. We had to endure since 2000, since the summer of 2005, until today, more than 14,000 rockets coming in from Gaza. This is an unimaginable number. But if you, if you would tell this to any American who's watching us right now, they, they won't believe it. 14,000 rockets. This is what our southern region had to live with uh, in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, so they really need, don't need an excuse. Um, but this is definitely a reason for them uh, to increase uh, the, the pace and the frequency of the attacks, but I can tell you that, uh, thank God, we are uh, perhaps better prepared than ever to handle this threat of, um, mm -hmm. of rockets. And um, I don't think Hamas is interested in escalating the situation with Israel. Professor, what is your so, take? Let, let's understand that violence is a tactic of choice used by Palestinians um, and it's not sporadic. It's not, uh, it doesn't arise from the street. It's clearly a tactic designed by leaders. Look, when Israelis don't like a result, like when the Gaza disengagement occurred, many Israelis opposed it, what do they do? Israelis bring a lawsuit uh, or they have peaceful protests in front of the prime minister's house, but they don't engage in violence. Uh, uh, the Palestinians historically have used violence as a tactic to try to threaten the world. And if any government, woe unto any government, whether it be the United States, Israel, or any other government, or the UN, that ever, ever makes a policy decision based on the fear of Palestinian violence, all that does is incentivizes the Palestinians to use violence more and more and more often. As Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin once said, Israel should deal with the violence as if there's no peace process and should continue to try to make peace as if there was no violence or terrorism. Violence cannot ever be used as a veto against the right thing. And what President Trump did was the right thing. And violence has to be dealt with by police and by military, not by giving in to those who use violence as a tactic. Well, what kind of impact is this going to have on Palestinian reconciliation talks? Ambassador? Well, I. Again, the, re the reconciliation, which I think is, uh, um, is, is not the most appropriate word to describe what they're trying to do. The biggest problem that we have historically with the Palestinian National Movement is that they never really made an effort to face their opposition from within. At the end of the day, for Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and all the uh, Islamic radical groups, the Palestinian national movement is no less of an enemy than Israel. And the failure of Yasser Arafat and then Mahmoud Abbas to realize that Hamas and Jihad have to be crushed, have to be dismantled, uh, that's the reason why we don't have peace today. So when they talk about reconciliation, they're not really talking about, um, you know, designing a better future for the Palestinian people. They're talking about a certain political configuration. Mm -hmm. There is no common language between the two. But you put the blame primarily on the leaders. Uh, some of the blame has to be on the people themselves. After all, 
there were elections uh, over the objection of Israel and over the objection of many thoughtful commentators. There were elections after the pullout of Gaza, and Hamas uh, did win some legislative elections. Nobody knows what would happen if the Palestinian Authority were subject to a democracy. Obviously, it's not a democracy. Uh, there hasn't been an election there in many, many, many years. And I think one of the reasons there hasn't been an election is the fear that an election might show that Hamas and Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad and other terrorist groups and Iranian surrogates are actually more popular. Look, if there were an election in Jordan, who knows how that election would really turn out if we're an honest election. Would it really maintain the Hashemite uh, uh, kingdom or would Palestinian radicals win an election there if it were a fair election? So uh, it's a very, it's a great paradox and a dilemma because we all love democracy, but we fear the outcome of democratic votes, if you could even have a democratic vote in those areas of the Middle East. So I think the blame has to be shared among leaders, but also among uh, some of the people uh, who uh, prefer uh, Hamas to peace with Israel. Look, I think Benjamin Netanyahu has always had the right approach to this, and it was the West Berlin, East Berlin approach. You know, people ask who knocked down the Berlin Wall. It wasn't the Pope. It wasn't President Reagan. It was the people of East Berlin who saw West Berlin and wanted to live the lives of West Berliners, affluent and free. And I think if the West Bank uh, could if everybody in the West Bank lived the way the people of Ramallah live, which is free and affluent and successful, and if the people of Gaza saw that the alternative to rockets and terrorism is life of the kind that today exists in a city like Ramallah, I think you might see changes in attitudes among people on the ground within the Palestinian Authority. Moving on to our next topic. Um one that I am personally very passionate about. The Israeli government has just clamped down on the country's community of African asylum seekers once and for all. The Knesset has officially notified them that they have three months to voluntarily be deported to an unspecified African country, or else they'll be thrown in jail indefinitely. There are about 40,000 of these refugees living in Israel, the majority of whom are from Eritrea and Sudan. And here's a look at a clip of just one of the young men that will be affected, a friend of mine named Mulu, who escaped military slavery in Eritrea. <laughs> שאני אקום כמו בן אדם בבוקר, להיות לעבוד, להיות חי, להיות שיש לי משפחה, שאצליח כמו שאני צריך כמו מה שעושה אותו בן אדם. חיים שלי. זה קשה. Now, that was just a short clip of a much larger piece about Mulu specifically, but obviously this is going to be affecting thousands of lives. And in almost no other developed country is forced deportation even legal. Um, and even though most countries consider these asylum seekers to be refugees, Israel has taken a hard line in defining them as illegal infiltrators. Thousands first fled to Israel without visas nearly a decade ago and claimed to have escaped genocide, persecution, and indefinite service in a slave army seeking a better life here in the Jewish state. Now, our viewers want to hear about not only the legal issues, but, but also please address the moral issue here and even the public diplomacy aspects. What is the right move for Israel to be making in regards to this issue? Well, I think in, in this case, uh, the public discourse has been part of the, the problem which was initiated as well by the government, referring to them as mistananim, effectively illegal infiltrators, mm -hmm. presupposing a, a determination of their status without, it, in, in fact, uh, investigating it. What is needed and has been needed for some time is a fair, effective, just refugee determination uh, process so that it can be uh, determined pursuant uh, to that uh, legal inquiry, which of them are indeed legitimate asylum seekers and which not. I believe the 38,000 who are here will be, ter be determined to show that, in fact, they are uh, refugees, having fled either the genocide in Darfur or uh, from Eritrea, which was regarded as the uh, North Korea of Africa. But when you go ahead and seek to remove them without having put in place an effective determination and just uh, refugee determination process, what you're doing here is not only denying them a due process, not only preemptively creating an arbitrary removal, but this may be very prejudicial uh, to Israel in, on a moral level, on a political level, and in fact, they can be a national asset for Israel rather than being seen as a burden. Professor Dershowitz? I agree, 
I agree. And Erwin and I were both deeply involved, of course, in the Soviet Jewry movement. Imagine if this was a situation having thousands of Russians who had escaped uh, climbing over the borders and making it to Israel. Uh, Israel would be welcoming them with open arms. And that's why uh, I very much worry, in addition to all the other factors, humanitarian factors, factors regarding Israel's special status as a place of asylum for, for Jews, uh, the whiff of racism uh, can't be avoided when you have a situation where 40,000 people of color are the ones who are being uh, deported en masse without being individualized and every single case considered on its merits. I just don't think that would have happened if the folks had been Russians or from any other country or uh, Jews who came here illegally, as many Jews, of course, did come illegally during the pre-state uh, uh, period. Uh, yes, of course, the law of return makes them uh, legal, but the law of return should be an affirmative law, giving Jews special status as refugees. It shouldn't be a law that excludes others from becoming uh, valuable uh, citizens. I agree with Erwin, too, that these are people who uh, can add enormously to um, Israel, uh, both in terms of what they can accomplish individually, and second, in terms of presenting Israel to the world uh, who many of whom now consider Israel as uh, apartheid and other kinds of absurd uh, 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 characterizations, uh, doing the right thing with regard to these 40,000 people uh, is a test, a true test of Israel's soul. And I support mm -hmm. what Irwin's doing. And I know how difficult it is. Look, my country, the United States, is trying to build walls, is trying to exclude uh, illegals who have come here. I guess I'm affected by the fact that 29 members of my own family came to the United States as illegal immigrants. In 1939, on the eve of the Holocaust, my grandfather got them fake, forged, perjurious affidavits, claiming that every one of them would be a rabbi, a shochet, a moel. Uh, and we applaud my grandfather for the great work he did in creating 29 illegal immigrants, one of whom became the chairman of the Department of Engineering at Columbia, another of whom became a very distinguished rabbi in Los Angeles, another a medical school uh, hedge fund op a device operator. Uh, these are people that can change the nature of, of the world. And, and America is a country of immigrants. Israel is a country of immigrants. It just has to do better mm -hmm. than what it's now doing. You know, and, and there are now reports saying that Netanyahu's government is offering $9,000 to Israeli citizens who will help remove these asylum seekers by force, which, I mean, I obviously would like to hear what the legal implications um, of, of such a move would be in the first place, but it almost doesn't make sense, kind of the financial burden of doing something like that versus um, integrating 38 to 40,000 people in the country, many of which have already been here uh, 10 years and speak Hebrew and write in Hebrew and, and are part of this society. It also creates a generation of vigilantes. We don't want uh, people to be paid to do the wrong thing. Uh, it will be a terrible thing to give people ransoms and payments to uh, round people up. Boy, does that sound like some, some, some aspects of the past that we just never want to see uh, repeated. This is a very bad thing for Israel, and Israel has to figure out with Irwin's help, because Irwin can help them. Uh, he has all the experience to do it. Uh, they should put Irwin in charge, make him part of a commission to look into this, and other people, we know how many good people in Israel would be able to do such a great job, but vigilante injustice is not the way of doing this. Professor Kotler, do you, do you have anything that you want to add from the, the legal you know, perspective here? Well, you know, Israel did the right thing at the beginning uh, when those who uh, fled uh, from Africa came here and gave them a temporary protected status. As a result of that temporary protected status, as, as you put it, Natasha, uh, the children who have grown up here, many of whom have been here now uh, for 10 years, know only one language, Hebrew, have only one identity, uh, which is Israeli. And we are taking these people and uh, deporting them arbitrarily without any due process uh, wh whatsoever.
from, as I said, from a moral, from a, a legal, whatever measure uh, you want to take, this is a bad uh, decision. We have the possibility here for a great resource for the state of Israel, and we're turning this into not only a situation of an illegal actions, but one that may resonate, regrettably, uh, internationally. What needs well, you know, yeah. there's a, a great, a great uh, Jewish Russian comedian uh, named um, Smirnov, I think, uh, who came to America, and he used to have this riff. Uh, he would be standing in front of the Statue of Liberty, and he would be saying to the Statue of Liberty, thank you, thank you, America, for bringing me and my family here, for saving us from the tyranny of the Soviet Union. And now, can't you help keep all those other damn immigrants out? That was his bit. And, you know, it wasn't funny when he said it, but it really was ironic. Here we have a country of immigrants who were saved, many of them, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, who are now turning their back on uh, other immigrants who happen not to be Jewish. That's just not the right approach for a country like Israel, of which we're so proud in so many ways, uh, to be represented to the world doing this kind of injustice. We'd like to start out with Bob Olshin from St. Louis, Missouri, who just isn't sure what latest headline we should most be worried about. So let's hear from him. Hi, I'm Bob from St. Louis. I was the vice president of a major aerospace here in Israel for a number of years. Now I came back to relax a while, just like Conan O'Brien. So I followed in his footsteps and I came over to Dr. Shakshuka, where, by the way, they have great shawarma, best in Tel Aviv. And that's not fake news. Now, fake news. Here's the question I have. Should I be worried about missiles coming from North Korea to America or from Iran to Israel? Or should I be worried about fake news, about the fall of the democratic systems in both Israel and America? Of course, the two are very closely related. Uh, you have to be able to rely on the news to know how much to worry about North Korea and Iran and other hotspots in the world. If we get to distrust the media, if we think that everything that's reported is fake news, we will begin to lose faith in the reporting that we're getting and the information we're getting even from our national and international leaders. And that will put us at a major disadvantage. Remember that we got into the war in Iraq, which was a terrible mistake, uh, through fake news. It wasn't necessarily deliberately fake news, but many of us believe our president and the media uh, and uh, Great Britain and other intelligence agencies that told us that Saddam Hussein uh, had weapons of mass destruction. Um, the war was started on that basis. And then we found out that it was fake news. Now, there's a big difference between deliberate fake news of the kind that I think partisans often drop into the conversation and inadvertent fake news. I actually believe that the accounts uh, about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq were well-intentioned. I don't think they were deliberately fake news. I don't think today we're getting fake news about Iran or about North Korea, but of course, people have uh, a stake in the outcome. Those who don't want to see a preemptive attack on either country tend to minimize the dangers. Those who advocate a preemptive attack or other uh, strategic decisions uh, tend to uh, maybe overestimate the threat. So there is a close relationship between the accuracy of news reporting and how much we should be worrying about missiles from North Korea and Iran and other places. Now, Professor, you just wrote a book. Can you tell us a little bit about the threat of the democracy posed by those using the criminal justice system and instead of the ballot box? Because I understand that is one of the main themes of, of this book, correct? It is the main theme of the book. Uh, it's called Trumped Up. Uh, how criminalization of political differences endangers democracy. It's mostly about the United States, but it also has a chapter about Israel, a chapter about what's going on now with the investigations of the prime minister, his wife, his, his uh, other members of his uh, family and, and people close to him. Uh, I have been writing about this for more than 20 years. Actually, I started writing about it when Prime Minister Rabin uh, 
was forced to leave office as the result of a relatively minor offense, his wife having a bank account in the United States. And uh, I don't believe that elections should be undone by prosecutors or by judges or jurors, except in extreme, extreme uh, cases. Um, in the United States, you cannot prosecute a sitting president, but you can impeach a sitting uh, president. And I worry on both sides of the aisle. For example, as we speak, uh, Senator Bob Menendez, a very strong supporter of Israel, is standing trial for very broad allegations of corruption. He flew on an airplane uh, owned by a close friend of his uh, and took some other gifts, reminiscent a little bit of some of the issues that are swirling around in Israel. And the Republicans are already putting out uh, demands that he resign as soon as he's convicted and not wait for his appeal because they want to fill his seat with a Republican because there's now a Republican governor of New Jersey and there may not be a Republican governor of New Jersey in four or five months after his appeal is done. So we see the Republicans criminalizing political differences. We see some Democrats trying to criminalize political differences by alleging that uh, President Trump obstructed justice by, in, by exercising his constitutional powers to fire the director of the FBI and take other actions, perhaps pardoning people. I think it's a serious mistake. So, so I wrote this, I wrote this book. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting title. It's called Trumped Up. Uh, it's an e-book uh, and a soft cover book. I did it very quickly. I wrote the book within three months. So it's not a book that you can get in a bookstore. You can only get it on Amazon, either as an e-book on Kindle or send for it, and they'll send it to you in a couple of days. It's only a couple of dollars. And I think it's an interesting read, both for Israelis and for Americans, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you don't want to see dangers to democracy by prosecutors, by police, by uh, politically uh, motivated, I'm not suggesting it's politically motivated uh, in any particular country, but you don't want to have elections undone uh, in ways that undercut the, uh, the votes of the now, majority of the rally. What do you do in the case that a leader is in fact indicted and is committing crimes while in office? It depends on the nature of the crime, obviously. Uh, our Constitution provides that if you're guilty of bribery or treason or other high crimes or misdemeanors, you can be impeached. In Israel, it's much easier to get rid of a leader who might be in some way corrupt. All you have to do is have a vote of no confidence. There's a very simple mechanism. The mechanism that I disapprove of is having a single prosecutor, no matter how uh, great his or her integrity or individual police officers making decisions that undercut democracy. Let the Knesset make the decision. Let the impeachment process go forward if there's sufficient evidence of impeachable offenses. But let not one prosecutor, particularly with vague, elastic, uh, accordion-like crimes that can be stretched to fit a political target, crimes like corruption or obstruction of justice, which have no inherent limiting principle and can be used by either political party to target other political parties. As Lavrenti Beria, the head of the KGB, once said to Stalin, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. It's not hard to find crimes when you have crimes defined as broadly as corruption and obstruction of justice. That's why I worry so much about the criminalization of political differences, regardless of which party benefits, which party loses. It shouldn't be done. That wraps up this edition of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, go to ILTV.TV or our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week.